happen. Um, it, it does happen, but it can be a bit of a problem. People's attitudes and sense of forgiveness is, um, is aberrant. I mean, he was locked up for three years when he was 15. I think if I would run into him at 18, there would be some hope with some of the uh, benevolent employers I've run into. I'm not sure whether uh, an apprenticeship is uh, particularly good for him. I think that uh, doing VCE, if you're in today's age, we have 500 VCE students here at RMIT, uh, he could do well in that. And I think he'd be add a bit of spice to legal studies, John, in the legal <laughs> studies section. Little doubt about that. Professor Margaret Gardner, do you take students who have been in prison? Do you give them a chance? Uh, we, we don't ask people about their personal circumstances. It is not a question of what people have done in the past. That's not a question that should be asked. We take people and give them an education. Uh, and we look to how they behave when they're with us, whether they, educate, whether they participate effectively in the education, not what they once might have done. And Simon Brown-Greaves, uh, does the educational opportunity change the criminal mind? Absolutely. Um, and, and again, you know, if we believe that there is such thing as a criminal mind, and there's plenty of debate about that, I would suggest that there's plenty of evidence that it can change. Um, there's no evidence in Ned's case that there was anything, um, you know, in terms of a pre-existing or uh, birth-related um, criminality about him. It was um, something that I think would have been amenable to all the programs we're talking about, and um, we probably would have got a pretty good outcome, I suspect. Well, I'm not sure that we can come up with too many examples. I can think of some that go the other way, but we'll play around with that and explore further the role of education in contemporary society and the contrast with Ned Kelly's era when we return after the break to the Old Melbourne Magistrates Court and Channel 31 at an RMIT-sponsored discussion and hypothetical about Ned Kelly and education. <laughs> Welcome back to Channel 31, to Federation Square on the big screen and here at RMIT University's use of the old Melbourne Magistrates Court for this hypothetical today. Better read than dead, would Ned Kelly have had a better outcome if he had been sentenced when RMIT's predecessor, the Working Men's College, was up and running just seven years after his execution? I'm John Fain. New Australians have often been left with no choice but to take the worst jobs on offer. Yet the need for skilled labour in our economy now grows all the time. John Rawlinson, as Managing Director of Talent2, how do you see the evolution of the job market and our skills base today? Yeah, look, it's well documented that, that uh, today we have unprecedented uh, low levels of unemployment and, uh, and shortages of workers right across the board. It's, it's not just uh, skilled workers, we have, we have uh, shortages uh, across the board. And um, yes, we do have... Uh, um, um, migrants that either are unskilled or the skills aren't properly recognised that um, you know, often have to take the, the jobs that are uh, lo lower paid uh, and jobs that, uh, that perhaps um, uh, others don't want to take. However, what we've seen is that it is a, uh, there is a world of opportunity out there and people can uh, quickly progress through different, uh, different opportunities, particularly if they get access to, uh, to good training and education. And, uh, you know, it is a terrific job market uh, in Australia at the moment. But we've got a bit of a mismatch, haven't we? And I wonder if there was one in Ned Kelly's time too. We've got people who are looking for work, we've got jobs that need to be done, and it doesn't make much sense that those two things can exist at the same time. No, it doesn't. And, and part of that's inefficiency, part of that's geographic. And, uh, you know, in, in, in Ned's day, um, you know, Ned probably had no uh, opportunity or way of knowing that there may have been good employment opportunities for him outside of his, uh, his area of, uh, of, of Glen Rowan. Um, probably had no real opportunity to move and get there. We, we now have a much more uh, mobile workforce and a much more efficient job market. So people get matched to jobs um, much more efficiently today than they, than they would have even 10 years ago. I don't know if there's anything terribly efficient about being told that the job you have to do is an hour and a half's drive away and it's at uh, a fairly low, if not basic, wage. That may be efficiency from one person's point of view, from another person's point of view, the same can be described as exploitation. Yeah, look, uh, uh, true, but I think the, the, uh, the way the employment market works at the moment is, is there's, there's certainly more opportunity around that, that will limit the amount of exploitation. And I think we're seeing that. The, uh, you know, the, uh, the role, yes, yes, they're, 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 I'm not saying exploitation of workers doesn't exist today, but the shortages mean that, um, you know, there, there really shouldn't be the exploitation. 
and yes, you might have to drive an hour and a half to get a low wage, but you can also move to the, the Pilbara and, uh, and earn $120,000 a year driving a truck. So, uh, you know, it really is a, uh, a world of opportunity in the employment markets as, as they exist today. Professor Margaret Gardner, how does an educational institution keep up with the changes in society? You still have to offer the traditional courses, people still want to know how to do welding or fitting and turning or whatever it might be, but at the same time they want to know about nanotechnology and electronics. How do you marry those two things? Um, well, the really important thing with most of the vocations and professions that we teach is you need to talk really carefully and closely with industry, so you do try to keep very abreast of what is happening and what is changing. And then you have to keep abreast of the newest research and so you need a strong research base to draw on because you have to know what's coming. You have to prepare people for the things that employers are not yet asking for as well. And, and that's effectively what an educational institution such as this does. You have researchers, they talk to you about the futures that are not yet here. Uh, you talk to industry about what they need now and together with that you take your educational understanding and out of that come the courses and the programs that students study and they change regularly. I mean there's some notion that you just said oh you do the welding and the fitting that you know you, you've done forever. Nothing that we teach now, even though we've been teaching for example architecture since 1887, it doesn't look anything like the architecture we taught in 1887, it draws on different technology. The same is true of the trades. Um, there are instrument technicians that once didn't exist. All those things change and that's basically how it's done. And it's a, it's a, a big um, set of skills that have to be nurtured inside the institution, but also that strong link to industry outside. How do you deal though with the challenge of recruiting people who can teach when there's a shortage of anyone with that skill whatsoever? And if you can make $120,000, as John Rowlandson told us, driving a truck up in the Pilbara, why would you go and earn half that teaching people at RMIT University? Um, well, uh, it certainly is a challenge. There are shortages, <laughs> there are shortages everywhere and there are shortages uh, in trying to find uh, academic staff. But one of the things I think that's one of the great things in the time I've been in universities, which is now unfortunately very many decades, uh, that couldn't the be. You're only 29. <laughs> the thing about academic staff is they tend to be passionate. It's one of those fields where people, this is what they love doing, and they stay, and they choose often to stay with us teaching and researching because that's their passion. And it is that which keeps all educational institutions currently alive. <laughs> but isn't it also one of the great truths of further education that you have an ageing workforce? I did a fitting and turning course at TAFE last year and all the teachers were in their 50s and could tell you how many hours, days, weeks and months until they retired and there was no younger coterie coming through to replace them. They are coming through, but it is certainly true that um, and, and again, we're no different here in Australia from the United States, the UK. The academic workforce is an ageing one and so there is a demand for lots of new people. This is a big policy issue in front of government if you want to have a very high quality higher education system. It's not just a question for the universities to recruit, it is how do we, how do we develop that next generation. That's a big question, it's one that's going to be in front of governments in the next month in an election campaign and it's one that's going to be very important for our future. And we're going to have to find the money, even though we know there's a $17.5 billion surplus and there's been enormous amounts of money, unprecedented amounts of money thrown into tertiary education, whether that's going to be the answer or not is going to be absolutely crucial. Are you optimistic or pessimistic, Margaret? Um, I am a born optimist <laughs> and I'm optimistic that people understand that education is important. I'm enough of a realist to know that we, that I think people think education is very important but that unless we get the investment right uh, and there is a need for significant investment then that future for the people who are currently seeking an education and the people we hope in the next 20, 30, 40 years need that education, that that's not going to be there in the with the quality we need unless we think seriously about what the funding is that produces the sort of quality that takes you forward 120 years.
Steve Dargaval, you head up the equivalent of the Metal Workers Union these days, and it's your members that knock up suits of armour when they're called for even these days. Now, back in the 1880s, as you told us, uh, Trades Hall helped raise funds for the working